So we're launching into a brand new series today, this weekend, uh, called Walk the Line, and it's this idea about our relationships go best when our relationships are going God's way. So I need a little bit of help. I need some participation real quick. Uh, anybody in here who's a sing- you're single, raise your hand, be proud you're single. I said be proud. Woo, a little woo's good. Uh, how many of you are married? Yeah, okay, let's give singles another chance because you can show that up too. You're single and you're here today. There you go. Okay, anybody who, you have a friend, like maybe one friend in the whole world, but you at least have a friend. Raise your hand, you've got a friend. Uh, anybody, a part of a family, you, you have a family of some kind. It may be dysfunctional, but you've got a family. Uh, you're a part of a group, some kind of a group, some kind of a team. I don't know, you're a part, you're a part of a group. How many of you had ever, have you ever had conflict in a relationship? And you're raising your hand, you're like, in the last 30 minutes? Yeah, yeah. Um, You've ever had communication challenges in a relationship? Anybody? All right. So we are, uh, you're all welcome here. Uh, This is for you. Um, Now, I want you to do something that's a little more evaluative and don't raise your hand or say anything out loud. I I want you to pick one of those areas of relationships. So whether it's marriage or friendship, whatever, and I want you to rate it, rate it. Like on a scale of one to 10, one being pathetic, like it's just pathetic, it's going a horrible one, 10 being it's lit, it is off the hook, <laughs> it is on the 10, beast mode. I'll, I'll, I'll translate, it's awesome. <laughs> one, it's not going very good, 10, it's going great, rank one of those areas. Now you don't have to tell me. But the purpose of this series for the next four weeks is this. Your relationships in this world, your friendships uh, as a single person in this world, as a married person in this world, you will never live at a 10 all the time. Your marriage won't always be perfect. Your relationship with your children or with your parents will not always be perfect. You will not live on the mountaintops of relationships all of your life. So the sooner we come to that reality, the better and adjust our expectations, this is a series for the ups and the downs of life and love and relationships. This is a series where we we hope to get perspective. We hope to get our expectations in line. We hope to figure out better ways to communicate, and we hope to figure out how to do conflict a little bit better through the ups and the downs. That's the purpose of this series. I could pray, say amen, and go home, but I won't. Because now I want to unpack. I, I want to introduce this whole concept. So if you have your Bibles, grab them, turn to Genesis chapter 1, the first chapter in the Bible. If you don't have a paper Bible like this, grab a smartphone, grab a tablet, follow along. But if you've ever had conflict, you need to hear what we're talking about. So let me just personalize it. I need to hear what we're talking about today. Maybe a lot. So this will be the fourth time I've heard myself say it. And I still need it. Still need to learn. And remember, I still need to unlearn some things as well. In Genesis chapter 1, as God begins to create everything that he has created or he's going to create, he speaks into being light, and there's light. He speaks into being the dry land, and there's dry land. He speaks into being, and there's a hippopotamus in all of its glory. And then you get to the sixth day of creation, And something unique and something profound and something that has the possibility to shape our perspective, the the things we hope for in this life, if we truly understand what's going on here. In verse 26 of chapter 1, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Now that's a pretty radical statement right there. Uh, There's all kinds of things going on. There's God saying our, and it's a little bit weird. Uh, I I don't have time for this, but theologically, even in Genesis chapter 1, we see the concept of the Trinity, Father, Son, Spirit. Our God is one God, but he has three representations, that, that God is Father, Son, Spirit, unified. Let us make humans, and then check this out, in our image. Something critical for us to understand what life is all about. What human life is all about. Let us, let us make 
mankind in our own image, in our likeness. Look, so that, that's purpose. So there's purpose. So that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Get the point? In the image of God. That there's something unique, there's something set apart, there's something about humans that puppies and kittens can never compare to. Unique in all of creation. And people, scholars, theologians have debated, well, what does this mean? Is it a rational capacity that we have that no other creature has? Well, yeah, probably. Is it cognitive ability? Is it immortality? Is it having purpose? Is it self-consciousness? Is it personality, intelligence, creativity? Yeah, probably all of that. And then for our focus today, it's also a relational ability to connect with God and to connect with others unlike any other aspect of creation. We were created to relate to God and to others, unlike any other aspect of God's creation. That makes us unique, created in the image of God, created with significance. And I don't know what people have told you. I don't know what kind of identity you hold. But as we just sang that song, I am a child of God, is an identity that is to mark us at the core of who we are, in the deepest parts of who we are, that an identity that can be discovered as a child of God, as a, as a person in Jesus Christ, that will be the one identity that can set us apart from every other identity created in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1 it is like a headline, just a couple of verses about God's creation of humanity. Genesis 2 begins to expound it. So go to the next chapter. Genesis 1 is like the headline. Like Then Genesis 2 is like the article, a little more detail. Look at verse 7 of Genesis 2. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Again, all other creation, God speaks and it happens. Here, God gets involved personally. There's a personal aspect, a relational aspect to creation, and God simply <sighs> breathes. Life, like the heart can beat on its own, the brain can function, the lungs can, can do their thing, blood can flow, but there's this transcendent reality that human life is found in God himself, and he breathes into man the breath of life. And the man becomes a living being. Verses 8 through 14, God has planted this garden. We get the details. It's a luxurious garden. It's a flourishing garden where there's food, there's, 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 there's trees. There's these two trees, the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's water. There's river. There's all this. Verse 15, and the Lord God took the man <clears throat> and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. There's even in the perfect setting of the garden, the perfect setting of creation, there's work to be done. There's some responsibility, and, and it's good, and it's beautiful. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man. Listen, the first commandment of Scripture. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. So here's, here's this idea. God is saying, Adam, follow me. Adam, do you trust me? I want what's best for you. I want you to experience all that you can. So follow me step by step, step by step. Follow me. This garden is yours. You can do whatever you want to do. There's just one thing. There's just one boundary. There's just one limit. There's just one line. Don't cross this line. There's one tree. Don't eat of that tree because in the day that you eat of that tree, you're going to die. Like, But everything else, you can do whatever you want to. And it's this idea, Adam, will you trust me? Adam, will you believe that I want what's best for you in life? Will you trust me? Verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, now this is very interesting, and for some of us it may be a little bit confusing, because here is Adam in a perfect 
place. Perfect creation, just Adam and God. And God looks at the perfectness of this creation and he says, it's not good. In the perfect creation that God has made, something is not good. Now, it doesn't mean it's bad. It means it's incomplete. It means it's, it's not going to allow life to flourish quite yet as God intended it to. Something is not good. And it's that Adam is all alone. Now, some of you hear that line and you're like, well, duh, God, I've been telling you I'm all alone. This is not good. Bring me a spouse. Hurry up. This isn't good. And you're like, well, God said it's not good. Duh, about time. Thank you. Others of you, you're, you're more introverted like me. You're, you're more of a personality that avoids relationships. And you're like, I'm all alone and I'm good. And God says, no, 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 no. It's not good that you be alone. Let me just say something really clearly. This is not God setting the scene that says, unless you're married, you will be incomplete forever. If you are single, it's a good thing to be single. Paul even tells us in Corinthians that the single person can live an undistracted life, but the married person is distracted. Why? Because they got married. <laughs> so if you're single, don't seek to get married. It's okay. You're good. You're not less than. It's a good Thing. And if you're married, stay married. It's a good thing. Relationship is what this is all about. We've been created to relate. I love this because have you ever thought about sometimes we've got songs in the Christian language that are like, I need you, God. I need you, God. You're all I need, God. You're all I need, God. You're all I need, God. God, you're all I need. And God is like, no, I'm not. It's not good that you're alone. I've created you to relate to other people. So here's the language. So God says, I will make a helper suitable for you. Now, uh, and so just to be sure there's no men with chauvinistic tendencies in this room who would hear, that's what I want. A helper is what I want, God. <laughs> the word helper, besides this time in Scripture, I think, is always used as a word to describe God himself. I look to the hills, where does my help come from? My help comes from God. I will lift my eyes, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Over and over again, the word help is, is used to describe this is the work of God. This is the way God relates to other people. It's not saying Adam needs somebody subservient. It's I've created humans, all humans, to relate with others and with God himself. So God says, I'll make a helper suitable. Look at verse 19. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all of the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Let me just tell you, here's what happens. Adam is sitting there, and God's got all this creation, and he's got like a male and a female animal, and they come before him, and Adam's like, aardvark. <laughs> Gorilla. <laughs> Platypus. <laughs> and he's just looking at this, and he's named, like, it's so weird, it's so crazy, but it's this portrait of relational uh, way of creating. God's involved in a relational kind of way, us relating to God, relating to um, others, and even relating to, to creation. Through and through, this is a picture of relationship taking place. But every pair of animals walks by. Every pair of animal walks by. Adam names them. Now, if Adam's like any of us guys who are thick-headed, I don't think he ever thought, well, where's mine? But God saw, and God said, it's not good that you're alone. Now, we live in a world where there's a lot of lonely people. The, the longer I'm alive and the more people I meet, I realize I'm surrounded by lonely people. Sometimes I'm a lonely person. We're, we're lonely in a crowd. There's rich people who are lonely, poor people who are lonely. It's, it's an epidemic all around us. And, and God says, I want you to hear this. It's not good that you're alone. I get your pain. You feel lonely. God sees that you feel abandoned. God's heart breaks. It's not supposed to be that way. God said it's not good. And so the Lord found a suitable helper for him. 
Look in verse 21. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, and then he closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man, and the man said, Whoa, man! I just added that. <laughs> but scholars say it's a song. It's, it's a poetic kind of a, they think it's the first love song of Scripture. And Adam sings out or he, he does this poetry. I don't know. I'm not going to try to do either one of those. He just simply says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So she, so, I can't even talk. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. And that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. And Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Now this is a passage that has a lot to say about marriage and that's a specific application. But I'm staying broad for the purpose of this. This isn't a marriage series. This is a relationship series we're in. And and it's this idea that we've been created for relationship. And there's some things that, that we can pull out of this text that it doesn't matter where we're at in life. Single, married, lots of friends or not many friends. Uh, family's not going well. Family's going great. That there's some fundamental core issues for us to wrestle with in this passage and in this series. The creative process of God and Adam is relational through and through, and it's instructive through and through. When the the Hebrew language says that God took a rib. In that original language, it literally means to take with his hand and to form and to fashion. See, the the creative process is relational. So, So what that helps us understand is every single person, woman and man, girl and boy, has been created in the image of God full of worth and dignity as a masterpiece of God's creation. So that in India, when there's a class, a caste of people at the bottom of the rung who are Dalits, and people call them untouchables. There's no such thing in God's eyes. There's no such thing as an untouchable in God's eyes. Every single human has been created in the image of God. And again, I say, in the image of God, worthy of honor and dignity. There is no place for racism or sexism or prejudice. In the image of God, all humanity has been created and of worth in the eyes of God. And it says that this is why a man leaves his father and mother, is united to his wife, and the two become one. Important word, one. In Genesis 1-5, the word one is used to describe the first day. There was evening and there was morning, and that was the first day, day one. In Genesis 1-9, the same word is used to be the place where the land uh, meets the sea. They gathered in one place. The word one can mean united. It speaks of unity as well. For a Jewish home of, a, of, of this day, of these ancient days, every single day there would be this, this verse recited. Every single day the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 4, every single day it would, re- would be repeated. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. The Lord is one. You can trust him. He's faithful. Even when our circumstances are hard, he's good. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And every day in a Jewish home, they would recite this. That the kids would know this through and through. That the Lord, our God, is one. And it, and it spoke of all of these attributes that God is faithful. That God doesn't give up on us. That, that at the core of life and at the core of relationships, having God in his proper place helps everything else make sense. Gives us the perspective that we need. Genesis chapter 2 ends with this simple idea, Adam and Eve had no shame, no guilt, no regret. They were in a perfect creation. And then in Genesis 3, everything changes. Even if but for a moment they took their eyes off of God, they, they stopped trusting God. They stopped walking step in step with God. 
And all of a sudden, that perfect garden was corrupted by sin. An evil serpent brought in deception. Eve blamed the serpent. Adam blamed Eve. Everybody's pointing fingers at everybody. And nobody's taking personal responsibility for their part. And sin came in and it created division. Division between humanity and God? Separated. Division between man and woman? Separated where there was supposed to be one, unity. Even in that moment, God comes to cover. God comes to give grace. God comes to say, I'm not giving up on you. You don't have to run away and hide. I still see you. I still love you. I still accept you. But the story of humanity from that moment forward has been one often of us running from God and God patiently pursuing us saying, I love you. I invite you back. Come back home, like the song we sang earlier, in my father's house, there's a place for me. And again and again, though, the story is tragic. Because as we look for so many things in life to give us meaning, for so many things in life to give us purpose, we often neglect that which really matters, the core. The core. And relationship problems come And we don't own our part, or we don't look at our heart. And so we're pointing fingers at others and circumstances. Well, if that would change, if they would be different. So I'm going to invite you to do something for a few minutes. Would you, for a few minutes, try not to point fingers to look outside? Would you say, what's what's my part? And God, where is my heart in this? Because I don't know about you. My mother always used to tell me that life was like a box of chocolates. Does anybody like chocolates like I like chocolates in here? Any, anybody? You want one? We try one? Here. Listen. Don't, don't eat it yet. Hold on to it. Do you hear me? Don't eat it yet. Anybody else? Okay. We'll go third row. Sorry. Bad throw. First row. Oh, right here. Okay. Chocolates here. All right. Ch- how far back can I go? Javier, right there. All right. So listen, listen, listen. Don't eat it yet because this week when I was thinking about chocolates, I was Googling chocolate-covered insects. And I was Googling like chocolate-covered larva, chocolate-covered crickets. I was Googling like, what kind of things can you have that are chocolate-covered? I'm not saying these are those. I'm just saying I Googled that. <laughs> but when it comes to, to like our lives and when it comes to us in this room today, like I think the reality is like every single one of these chocolates, it looks great on the outside. Everything on the outside looks like it's fine. And, 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 and you look like you're fine but I don't know what's going on inside of you any more than you guys know what's inside of that piece of chocolate. The question is, can you trust me? Or am I sadistic and I want to see somebody eat a cricket leg? (laughs) That's the question. Like, can you trust me when it comes to this? Because all of us are looking at an exterior and we're like, I don't know what's going on on the exterior. And the truth is, only I know what's going on in the interior of your chocolate. And only God knows what's going on inside of your heart. And only God knows the pain, the frustration, the brokenness. And so before we point fingers at other people, can we take a look at what's on the inside? And and I want to invite all of you who have chocolate. Just try it. You can trust me. This is good chocolate. Now, it's an assorted variety, so I can't promise you what's in it, but there's no insects in that. You can trust me. I would love for you to enjoy chocolate. In fact, there's an entire box of chocolates. Anybody who wants one can come grab one right now if you want to while I'm talking. You can trust me. They're good. For the third time in a row this morning, I bit into one with caramel. (laughs) Now I can't talk. (laughs) Do something. If you have your Bible, go to Genesis chapter 22 with me. Nobody wants chocolate, huh? We can come get chocolate if you want to. Seriously, this is messing me up right now. (laughs) Okay, Matthew chapter 22. There's a group of religious people. Help yourself. You know what? Take the box, offer them a few, and then just distribute around the crowd as you see fit. Share. Share love in chocolate. There's a group of Sadducees who are religious people who come to Jesus, and they're trying to trick him. They're trying to trap him, and they're arguing about marriage of all things. And it's not like they really want to know. 
It's that they're trying to trap Jesus. They're trying to get him to say something that will get him in trouble. Man, you guys really like chocolate, huh? <laughs> so Jesus addresses Matthew 22, verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together, and one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. I mean, it's not ever good when a lawyer is conspiring to trick you with a question. You're in a bad place. But this person's a Pharisee, which means he's a religious leader, and then he's an expert in the law, and he knows the law. Through and through, he knows these points. And he has a question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Here's what he's asking. What's the one thing? What's the one thing that matters? What's the greatest? What's the first? What's the highest? What's the priority? Jesus, tell me something to do. What's the thing that I should do above all other things? Well, the question is complicated. What commandment are you talking about? We just read a commandment in Genesis chapter 2. Don't eat of the tree. Is that what you're talking about? Are you talking about the Ten Commandments? Are you talking about the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other commandments that Jewish religious leaders had come up with to say, do this, do this, do this, do this, and on this side, don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do. What are you talking about? And Jesus doesn't fall into his trap. Jesus simply responds and says this. You want to know what the first commandment is? Verse 37. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. He's like, you want to know what matters more than any of those other things? Do you want to know what to do more than all of those other things? Love God. Love God. See, I could look at relationships and I could say, I want to be the best husband I can be. And I could read every book on being a husband. I could read every book on trying to understand women. That would take a while. <laughs> and still I could miss God in the process. But if I say the core of what really matters, and the core of what matters most is loving God first. That love has the power to put all other loves in its place. All other loves have the power to distract us from the one thing that matters most. Beware. Beware. And the invitation to look at our hearts and to look at ourselves is to say, there's all kinds of things we can love. There's all kinds of things we can value. But nothing compares to God. And not one of us woke up one morning. Not one of us has ever woken up any morning and said, today's a good day. I'm going to start loving God today. You didn't do that. Something happened and God revealed his love to you first. Something happened and God broke through your hard heart, my hard heart, with his love. Uh, that's what Easter was all about last week. That cross that we had is this portrait. Paul says, God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how God demonstrates his own love. And we don't wake up one morning saying, I think I'm going to choose to love God. We wake up to a God who has loved us first. And then we begin to be overwhelmed with God's love. And, our, and God's love begins to overflow from our hearts, first of all, to God himself. And we begin to love God with our heart, our soul, our mind, strength. You know, people want to debate what's soul, what's heart, what's strength, what's mind. It's all of us. <laughs> every bit of us. That every bit of us starts to look at God as first and primary. And we love God with all that we are. Now, the lawyer asked, what's the number one? Jesus had a two-for-one special going that day, and he immediately just keeps on, he keeps on talking. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, oh, by the way, you know those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of commandments, all the do-do, do this, <laughs> and all the don't do this? All of it. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This is the core of what it means to follow God step by step through the ups and the downs, through the, the good times, through the bad times. The core is love God with everything you are and love others, love your neighbors as yourself. So here's a couple questions. Who's your neighbor? 
And you're like, well, I share a wall with this person, but I, like, I try to drive in my garage and close the door before they ever come. Like, when I take out the trash, I look to make sure nobody's out there, and then I roll it because I don't want to talk to them. Or I have a welcome mat by my front door, but every time the doorbell rings, I cringe. Yep, those people, we're talking about them. But we're also talking about, if you're married, your spouse as your closest neighbor. If you have kids, not like you have three kids, but you have this one and this one and this one individually. They're your neighbors, your friends, your roommates, your coworkers, your classmates. Love your neighbor as yourself. That God's love would overflow from us to them. Love your neighbor, but this part's, this part's tricky. As yourself. You're like, no, I don't think they want me to do that. <laughs> and God says, no, 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 it's a hard issue. If that's why this is so important. This is why this is so important for conflict and communication and expectations. Those are our next three weeks we're going to talk about because we're, we're loving as ourselves. That's why we need to say, God, search my heart, evaluate myself, because when it comes to conflict as ourselves, some of us are just a little more aggressive. Conflict? Okay, conflict, bring it on, let's talk. Others of us are like, conflict? I don't have any conflict. Let's avoid conflict. I'm going to get away. It's like, no, no, you have to have your heart in a right place. You have to be the person who's relating to God and others appropriately before you can ever expect anybody else to relate to you appropriately. So God, search my heart. Because on the outside, just like those chocolates, you can be here and everything looks fine. But on the inside, you may be falling apart. And God says, I don't care about that exterior you present. I care about your heart. And I want to meet you in the brokenness. I want to meet you in the pain. I want to meet you in the frustration. I want to fill you, so fill you up with my love that that love overflows because God's a relational God. He invites us into relationship. It overflows in love to God with everything that we are, and it overflows to others. So how are we going to do that? I have three things to talk about. How can we do that? Number one is this. This is something that we're going to do as a a church. We're going to do four weeks of this teaching called Walk the Line, and then not this Wednesday night, but the next Wednesday night, it's April 18th, we're going to do a a midweek option on Wednesday nights where you can come back and we're going to go into more detail on what we talk about this week and next week. For, for a few weeks. So starting on April the 18th, three Wednesday nights in, the row, in a row, we're going to do what's called continuing the conversation. You can go online. You can go to our app. You can find more information on the app and online. You can submit a question. So if this week or next week, a question in your mind is sparked by the teaching, email that question to us. And on the 18th, I'm going to have our very own Dr. Cameron Lee from Fuller Seminary, a marriage and family expert, answering some of the questions that you submit with me. We're going to talk about it. We're going to have some time to learn together. Um, You show up at 530. You can buy dinner. So we're going to eat. We're going to hang out um, upstairs for our children, um, K, kindergarten through fifth grade. They're going to go through three weeks of walk the line. What does it mean for children to learn how to do relationships right? Our junior hires are going to be on Wednesday nights going through the curriculum. Our high schoolers as well on Sunday nights. Um, And then you show up to eat. The back of this room is going to have inflatables and bounce houses so your kids can come. They can play. They can jump. The only thing that you would have to pay for is the food if you want it. Child care will be free for the, the babies and the preschoolers. And then the kids will have that. We're going to, for three weeks, say, how do we do this better? That's one way. Yeah, we're excited. We're thrilled about that. So, so here's the deal. If you are excited about that, please don't just clap. Please go online and sign up because we, we need to prepare for you. Hillsiders are really good at procrastinating. Could we maybe break that right now? <laughs> go sign up. Let us know so we can prepare. Um, number two, pray. God, search my heart and get in scripture and say, God, change my mind. We need to be reminded of the story that God created us because there's some stories that some of us are carrying around that, that, that are like echoes in our head. I'm not worth, I always let people down. I'm going to drop the ball again. Like, I don't know what the stories are, but we need to change the story and we need to be reminded I have been created in the image of God. 
God has created me perfectly. It doesn't mean everything's perfectly right, but it means God has created me. I'm a masterpiece of creation. You need to allow God to change the story that's in your mind. You, you need to remember some of the right things, renew your mind around some of the right things, and you need to unlearn some of the wrong things you've been believing. And so do I. And so do I. And so prayer is not just this activity, check, I did it. Reading the Bible is not this check, I did it. It's this God, shape me and form me and keep doing your creative work in me as I respond to your love through your word revealed. So doing that, doing that, is sometimes just as important as saying, I'm working on a relationship, I'm working on a relationship, I'm working on a relationship, saying, no, 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 God, work on my heart. Second, or third, sorry, I'm so messed up. Um, seek to learn and to grow through others. Sometimes what we need is somebody else to speak into us what they see. Can I, can I just say, Americans, we're not always the most self-aware people. We don't always see ourselves very clearly. Sometimes we need to go through a rooted group for 10 weeks to have some other people say, you know what I'm seeing in you? I love you anyway, but I'm seeing something ugly. <laughs> I love you anyway. And I get it. Some of us, we have deep trust issues. So when you have deep trust issues, here's my recommendation. Then pay somebody to help you. They're called counselors. <laughs> and in my personal theory... Um, I've met a lot of people in this life, and I think every single person I've ever met, I would say every single person should be in counseling, <laughs> period. And I, I'm, not, I'm dead serious when I say that. And I'm saying if you value the condition of your heart and if you value the condition of relationships, why not? We pay people to give us golf lessons. Why? Because we love golf. We pay personal trainers. Why? We want to be healthy. We pay for tutors. Why? We want to do good in education. Then why in the world wouldn't we want our hearts to be in the right place and our relationships to be in the right place? So, for some of you, it's getting help from someone else. And there is nothing wrong with that. In fact, that is a courageous step. And I would even say this. Some of us need to get help before we get into trouble. You know how many conversations we have that after the big blow up, after the disaster strikes, what if we proactively said, God, get our hearts in the right place before we make a dumb choice, before we lose sight of you, before division comes. God, search our hearts so that because life will be up and down, relationships will be up and down, but God can steady us and God can be a rock because he's faithful and he's good no matter what happens. You can trust him. Let's pray. God, would you pour out your love all through us, saturate us in your love that your love would overflow. God, in this room, we know that there are marriages that are in crisis. There are friendships that there's such division. There's parent-child relationships that are breaking hearts. There's all kinds of challenges we face when it comes to relationships. And at the same time, there's also marriages that are thriving friendships that are going great, wherever we are on this journey of the ups and downs, God, we want to be prepared. Maybe there's single people in this room that they think if only I had a spouse, that would be everything I dreamed of. No, it wouldn't. At the core of who we are, the one we long for is God and God himself. Jesus and Jesus alone. So God, you're the one who brings life. You're the one who breathes life. And so we want to follow you. We want to trust you. We want to experience in every relationship the way that you would cause us to flourish, to find joy, to find hope, and to live in love. So we search our hearts. For some of us, it's brokenness, and we want to turn the brokenness over to you and say, help, God, would you heal? For others of us, we've been the ones causing hurt. 
And today we need to stop it. And today we need to say, I'm sorry. And today we need to plead for your forgiveness. And today we need to stop acting like that. Overwhelm us with your love and your grace as well. Be glorified through our relationships. Be honored in our relationships. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.